everyone. How's the energy in the room right now? Uh, I seem better. <laughs> Okay, welcome to the last session of the day. Uh, my name is Angel. I know that's rather unpronounceable for many of you. <laughs> I come from Spain, like the other Angel. Where are you? Where's the other Angel? Hey, Angel Diaz Maroto. Uh, everyone seems, you know, we, we bump into each other a lot. We are good friends. We are both from Spain. And then everyone says there's two Spaniards in the room and they are both named Angel. Angel must be a very, like, typical or popular name and... No, it's not. He's like the other Angel that I know in Spain besides my own kid. <laughs> but everyone seems to think that Angel is like the new Jose or something, I don't know. It's <laughs> so there's two reasons I'm up here today. One is uh, it's Friday, it's five, and then you have someone which is in your way between this conference and your beers. And that's a difficult place to be. <laughs> So usually, and it's happening over and over and over in the European conference scene, they say, hey, let's bring the Spaniard, that crazy guy that yells at people, takes jokes, and I'm like, ah, okay, I'll get it. <laughs> so yeah, it's like the most difficult spot, and yeah, I like it, I enjoy it. The second reason, I guess, is because um, we want to make things difficult for the guys in the translation booth. Hey guys, how you doing? <laughs> so they say, let's bring someone that speaks really fast and thinks that he can talk English, but he can't. <laughs> so it's going to be interesting, okay? So yeah, I have some experience with uh, like instant translation. I was once in Poland and I was swearing a lot. I don't do that anymore, like in public places. But I was saying like, F this and F that and Fing, whatever. And the guys in the translation booth, they seem to be translating the F word to something nasty in Polish. Like a very, very, very bad word. And everyone in the room was like, <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what was, what was happening uh, until the, the talk ended and then somebody like told me the problem. So I would try not to use so much slang in this talk. Anyway, um, I'm from here from Spain. I've been in the Agile ecosystem for the last 11, year, 11 years, 11 plus. I founded my own company in 2007 and I coached several companies around Europe and in Latin America mostly. Um, I've worked with telecommunication companies, electronics, video games, medical, uh, aerospace, military security, finance, banking, insurance, governance, uh, government, I'm sorry. So you have it, I've seen it. <laughs> and most of the time, what I try to do is instead of telling you about frameworks or tools or things that you can read on the books, I tell you about my own experience, like helping these guys solve problems. That's what I do for a living, trying to help my customers uh, improve their organizations, okay? Here's my Twitter handle, angel underscore M, if you want to feed my hungry ego. It's always hungry for tweets and retweets and faps and things like that. Also, if you take pictures of me and you post them online, it's like way difficult for me to take them here. It's not polite to take selfies on stage. <laughs> So anyway, I want to talk about um, the Agile organization, and I'm going to tell a story, one of my many stories. This is a story of a Latin American bank, a Colombian bank. I've been working with them for the last three plus years, and we've done some amazing things. Right now we have like 6,000 people working under more or less Agile conditions. We have teams. Uh, trying Agile ways of working in five different countries. Um, and we've expanded agility from the software teams to teams in human resources, purchasing departments, risk, legal, audit, um, and you know, the whole banking ecosystem. And that's what I want to talk about because uh, I think you have amazing resources these days on how to work with software teams and even how to interact with business. By the way, business and technology, we have to stop that. Technology is the business these days, okay? It's not like the business guys and the technology guys. And many of the things I want to talk about are, have many things to do with this. Like this, the, the thinking that we have business on one side and we have technology on the other, we have to think about the whole system from the customer has a problem until we solve the customer's problem and with any luck, in the meantime, we made some money. That would be nice. So my story starts uh, November 2015. Uh, I was called to this bank and I had a meeting with two guys in this bank. Um, oh, Angel, you've lost a lot of weight since then. Really? Yeah, you noticed, right? 
yeah, I, I lost, I dropped some weight. <laughs> anyway, um, November 2015, I met with two guys from this bank, and they said, you look, we called you here because we want to develop um, an agile framework, an agile process for this company. We need an agile way of working. We need to develop some framework. We need some process. And I said, no, no, that's not what you want. <laughs> and they said, uh, yes, we're pretty sure that's what we want. And I'm like, well, let me rephrase that. Let me restate that. That might be what you want. That's not what you need. Okay, you think that if you have a process, if you have a framework, if you have some tools, then you will, what? Be agile? What's that? And they couldn't answer. I was like, what's the problem you're trying to solve with an agile framework? And they thought about it, and they say, well, we are trying to solve the problem that we don't have an agile framework now. And <laughs> yeah, nice try. <laughs> That's not your problem. Maybe your problem is your customers are pissed off, or maybe the problem is you are too slow, maybe the problem is your competitors are more innovative, maybe your problem is your people are leaving the company, maybe your problem is everything is so expensive, I don't know. And they say, yeah, all of that, and on top, a lot of other problems. And I'm like, okay, now we got something we can work with. No? And, and I think that the first thing that I explained to these guys is that when you're trying to make your whole organization more agile, there's uh, tools and there's practices, then there's frameworks, and then there's the mindset, okay? So maybe, and I will try to draw here, maybe in the tools you have things like, I don't know, TDD, or maybe you have story points. Mm -hmm. Things like, you know, planning poker. Mm -hmm. ah, how about we have these cards and then we all, you know, raise our numbers and then we play at the same time. It's a technique. It's something you can learn and you can use in a lot of environments. Or maybe you are like, hey, we have a board and we have things that we need to do, things that we are doing and things that are already done. And you're like, okay, that's nice. Is that going to transform your organization? Nah, not much. Those are techniques. Um, and many companies have focused on the techniques, on the tools. Um, I've even met many companies where they say, no, we are not doing Scrum, we're doing Kanban instead. And I was like, what's the reason we are not doing Scrum? Oh, there's a lot of meetings in Scrum. And you're like, yeah, right? And there's a planning meeting, and there's a daily meeting, and there's a retrospective meeting, and there's a... So instead of that, we just do post-it on the board. We just do post-its on the, on the wall. So we keep doing everything the same way we've done it for the last 40 years. But now, every single time we have to do something, we write on a post-it note and we put it on a wall. And then when we are already doing that, we move it to another column and then it stays there for months and months and months. And then at some given moment we say, hey, it's done, then we move the post-it. And yay, we are agile. Okay, nice try. That's what I call cosmetic agility. It's like we put some post-it notes, huh? <laughs> and then we look agile, fantastic. <laughs> people can come to our company and we also have like these puffs, these color puffs, and people are sitting on the, on the floor, like in Google, and you're like, mm. <laughs> nice try, okay, it's better than nothing. And then you have frameworks, um, you have Scrum, you have XP, uh, you have Less, you have Safe. Oh, he said Safe! Boo! <laughs> yeah, I'm an SPC consultant. Sue me. <laughs> and you have lots of frameworks. One of the favorite sports of Agile people nowadays is bashing the frameworks. Oh, you're still doing Scrum? I'm past that. I'm a post-Agilist. <laughs> oh, excuse me? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I keep doing Scrum with teams and I love it. I don't know, you know, it's, yeah. I will talk about this, okay? Some people are way past Scrum and then they believe that everyone should be past Scrum. And that's like saying I'm, you know, I'm climbing the Everest and if you are doing some rock climbing at your club, that's stupid and you should stop doing that and you should go to the Everest. Maybe they are not ready. Maybe there's a curve. Maybe there's a learning, okay? I don't know. So you have frameworks, fantastic, but then uh, above that you have the mindset, and in the mindset you have agility, and you have lean, and you have many other things that are more in the, in the state of mind of the people doing it. If you have people that master Scrum but they don't have the right mindset, what you have is another flavor of cosmetic agility. And you have this company saying, oh no, we used to be waterfall and have like project managers and all that. We don't have project managers anymore. Now we have product owners. And you're like, what's that? 
And they say, oh, he's the project manager. We changed his name. <laughs> and you're like, okay, tell me more. And they say, well, now the project manager uses to come every month because we do one month iteration. And you're like, oh, Jesus Christ, it's going to be one of those days. <laughs> We do one month iterations and then the project manager, oh, I mean the product owner, arrives and he brings the backlog and it's a list of requirements. Although we don't call them requirements anymore. We ask the project manager, oh, I mean the product owner, to call them user stories. And you're like, oh, tell me more. Oh, yeah, he used to say, oh, I have this thousand of requirements. And then the team said, no, you're not supposed to bring requirements anymore. You have to bring user stories. And the first time, the project manager, oh, sorry, the product owner said, what are user stories? Oh, yeah, you know, you have to say, as a user, I want to print a report so I can read the report. And oh, I see, I see. So here's a user story for you guys. As the project manager, I want these thousand requirements in a month so I don't chop off your heads. How do you like that user story? And they're like, I'm oh, all right. Good to go. Thank you. Oh, I love it when you, when you get excited in the first five, five to 10 minutes of the talk. I'm doing right. It's my first time in Ukraine. I don't know about your sense of humor. I could be bumping. I don't know. Then you can blame Alexei. He was the one that chose me. <laughs> So anyway, you have this team that now has a user story and now you have a backlog and there's an estimation, which is one month. It needs to be done in one month, so it's estimated and you have a backlog and you have user stories, okay. So now you keep going and then every day the project manager, excuse me, the product owner comes and say, hey, um, how many user stories have you done today? And people say, you know, three. And say, you said you were going to do five. And they say, yes, why did you do three instead of five? I always, I, I'm always marveled at these kind of questions. It's like, you said you were going to do eight stories in the sprint and you only did six. And you're like, yes, why? And I'm like, why do you think? Take a guess. <laughs> Take a wild guess, what do you think? No? So anyway, there's like reporting on the daily meeting, no? and everyone is reporting their tasks. More about that in a minute. And then at the end of the sprint, we present something to the customer, the customer hates it, and he yells at us, and he curses, and we call that a review. And then, <laughs> and then we go to a bar, and we ask for gin tonics and vodka, and we say, man, it sucks working here. Retrospective, check, 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 check. Certified in Scrum, you're doing everything in the book. <laughs> you're doing the same thing for real. Cosmetic scrum, we call that. Uh, you don't have the mindset. You are doing all the ceremonies. You are doing all the processes. You are using all the tools. You have backlogs and user stories and estimates and story points and whatever. You don't have the mindset. Uh, so the first thing that I did in this company is, was, hey, let's try to make people understand what's the mindset. And I also had this problem that they say, okay, we want to work with the development teams and we want to make Scrum in the development teams. And I say, yeah, I've seen this movie before. I've been there. I remember a time where I was working at a telecommunication company and in this telecommunication company, they had a process where they started with something they called, I don't remember exactly, but it was something like collecting all the ideas of things that could be like profitable and then you had to write a business case and then after the business case there was like a project review board that was selecting which projects would be done and then there was like capacity management which is where you have got to assign a, an architect and a consultant and, and I've seen people that are already laughing like, yeah, we have the process already. <laughs> and here comes the punchline. Here comes the punch, eh? and then here they did scrum. <laughs> and then they had the, the release management process, which is they had to have everything that different teams were doing and put it together, and then they have like load testing and security testing, and then they had to schedule the rollout of the new uh, functionalities, and then they had the, the release, and then everything was over. Full lead time, uh, one year and a half, maybe. Full lead time since idea to the idea was in operation. That was one year and a half, sometimes two years. Average time for a team to develop one feature, three months. So you have three months of agility, of scrum, let's call it like that in a full lead time of one year and a half, that's about 85% water quality rate. 
which is a, a number that I'm using a lot. Let, let's see how you translate that, guys. <laughs> in the translation booth. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about you guys. I feel like a lot of compassion. <laughs> water folly rate, like it's how water fallish is your process. And you are like, 80% of the time we are in a waterfall process. But here, we have five guys in a room with post-it notes doing scrum, so we are an agile company. I'm like, oh. Screw my life. <laughs> so yeah, I tried to make this thing, these people understand that agility was not about using post-it notes or having development teams uh, uh, using these kind of tools. I said, you know what? And this was, you know, the first time I used that, this was in 2013, 2014. I said, you know what? Agility at the end of the day, it's about four things. Four things. You only have to make sure that you're doing four things right, but this is very, very difficult. The first thing is you have to be sure that you are delivering value early and often, frequently. Thank you. The second thing you have to make sure is that you are adapting whatever you're doing to the feedback of the customers, so you need customer collaboration, and to the results, like, okay, we did something. Is this something solving the problem or not? Because many times you are like, this is what I need, then you develop it, you put it online, nobody uses it. And you're like, oh crap, I hope we learn something about it and when we pivot. And the whole reason that, not the whole reason, but one of the main reasons that we are delivering value frequently in small chunks in iterative incremental development is so we can fail, learn, and then correct, adapt, check. So we call that a feedback loop, an inspect and adapt process. And then you need Awesome teams, and I will try to describe that later. And you need continuous improvement. Oops. And that's it. You're set to go. That's it. Four things. If you read the manifesto, everything that you read in the manifesto can uh, be traced back to one of those four things, except for the obvious statements, what I, how I call them. There are some things in the manifesto that I love, but are obvious statements that you can use anywhere. Like for instance, technical agility, I mean, technical excellence enhances agility. And you're like, excuse me, manifesto, are you saying that working with technical excellent people is better than working with technical non-excellent people, like, like crappy ex technical people? Uh, manifesto say yes, and yeah, well, thank you, manifesto, I didn't realize that. <laughs> I've come that far, manifesto. But also, technical excellence enhances whatever, enhances waterfall process. If you have a waterfall process and you have excellent people, it's gonna be better. Okay, so it's like obvious, and then you are like, motivated people are better than demotivated people. No shit. <laughs> <gasps> that was a lightning manifesto, thank you so much. <laughs> But that's, you know, you could apply that to anything, not just agility. The difference between a waterfall company and an, and an agile company is that an agile company delivers value early and often, and those deliveries are something that allows the company to adapt, to change, to improve, and also that you have teams that are systemic teams, teams that are aimed to solve a problem, not just to do tasks. These four things. So let me go a little bit into each of them, because I want to go further into the model. This is one part of a model, by the way. Um, so we said, um, early and frequent delivery of value. I love that one. Okay, for me it was one, the, the first breakthrough that made me fall in love with, uh, with agility. Because I was used to working in traditional projects, okay? I did a lot of, you know, network deploys and things like that. So I was trained in the PMI, the PMBOG, and all these kind of things, and gun charts and the whole stuff. Um, and you know how it goes, no? You have to first figure out the whole project and then you have to build all the tasks and all you need and try to figure out the dependencies and then you start estimating and at some given moment you have a, a, an estimate and you have a deadline, okay? So this is the deadline, this is the, the moment where we will deliver the project. And the delivery of value over time goes something like this. You start the project, and you deliver nothing, 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 and then you reach the deadline, and then you deliver nothing, you deliver nothing, you deliver nothing. Some people get fired. So you've been there, right, Acacia? You know, when someone says, like, I don't get it, I'm like, you're so lucky, motherfucker. 
<laughs> Where are you working? I work at Spotify. Ah, that makes it. <laughs> so at some given moment, somebody says, okay, I, don't, I, can, I can stand it anymore, ship whatever, and then you put whatever on, on production, you, you put whatever live, just to say, we made it, okay? So you deliver some value, hopefully. <laughs> And then the next project, do you do the same and the same and the same? And the promise of agility or the idea of agility is, hey, how about we start delivering small chunks of value over time? Maybe we are not faster, I don't know. Maybe we are not faster. Maybe it takes the same time to complete everything, but by this moment, by the deadline, I have something that I could ship if I wanted. And then suddenly I have three options at the very least. Option number one, I could cut it there and say, okay, we have managed to do 75%, 60%, whatever the value, and there are some things that we thought we were going to be able to do, and guess what? We couldn't. Oh, guess what? We failed on our estimates. What do we need? Better estimates. <laughs> yeah, nice trick. <laughs> it's like, oh, I didn't win the lottery. I need better numbers in the lottery. <laughs> okay, nice. Uh, keep trying. We only have been trying for, I don't know, 2,000 years. <laughs> so anyway, we could say, okay, that's it. Uh, I thought we were going to integrate with, I don't know, with our mobile application. We didn't have time, but we have something that works and solves 75 to 80% of a project, of the problem, sorry. And we are good to go. And then maybe the team can start working on something else, something that might be way more valuable in this time than this tiny increment of value that we can put on top of something that already works. That would be my first option. Then you have option number two. Option number two is we ship this product with 75 to 80% of the functionality that we estimated, and then we work on something that is more pressing, more urgent, and then we can decide if we keep working on version two of the product, which has all the functionality and all the things that we expected at the beginning. That's an option. And then you have option number three, which is we keep going. We keep going until it's done, which is the same thing that you had when you were doing a waterfall project, only that now you can choose, you have choice, and that's the great promise of agility. We have found ways of doing this better, never worse. You will never be in a worse place if you're doing agility than if you're doing waterfall or traditional development. So it should be obvious, but I travel around the world and I see all, the, all these product manager, product owners that come with backlogs and these backlogs have like, I don't know, 1,000 user stories or 1,000 epics and I say, hey, product owner, what's the minimum amount of features we need to have something that can hit the market? A minimum marketable feature set. And they said, 1,000. And I'm like, what if we have 999? And they say, it's useless. <laughs> and I like that, we're going to fail by design. <laughs> we are designed to fail. If we can make 999 features on time, but we fail in the last one, we haven't done it. We are out of budget, we are out of scope, we are out of deadlines, I don't know. So we are designing for failure. Because we still have product owners and product managers that are in love with the products, and they say, if I say, okay, I could do with 100 features, I know that we only do 100 features, but I want everything. Have you ever used the metaphor of the scooter and the Ferrari, where agile development is uh, the, 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 the product owner, the product manager, the client asks for a Ferrari, and first we do like, you know, skates, uh, and then we do like a scooter, and then we do a motorbike. Don't use that metaphor. It's a shitty metaphor. Everything your client is listening is, I want to, uh, I will ask for a Ferrari, they will give him a scooter. And they call that, they call that agility. <laughs> they hate it. <laughs> I was in this company, in this bank, like several months ago, and we had a meeting with like a hundred uh, top executives, and one person raised their hand, and I said, you know, my, my concern with agility is that we have scooters everywhere in this company right now. <laughs> And, there, and I want a Ferrari, and I have scooters everywhere, and is this agility? And I say, okay, uh, I get your point, and I say, is, it, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And everyone was silent, and I was like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And he said, a bad thing, and I'm like, no, wrong answer. The, the, the right answer to these kind of questions, which are complex questions, 
It's, it depends. That's from Henrik Niebuhr. He says, if a, if a question is complex enough, the best answer is always, it depends. And if people just ask, it depends on what? You can answer, oh, that also depends. <laughs> that's Henry Niebuhr, that's on me, okay? So I'm quoting him. So anyway, I say, it depends. What do you want? If you want to win the Formula One World Series, a thousand scooters is a shitty solution. But if you want to move every one of you to another place in Kiev this afternoon, I prefer to have 1,000 scooters than to have one Ferrari. So it depends. Maybe what we need right now is a lot of small products with just the right amount of functionality that can hit the market and provide some value soon and some learning. Okay, so it depends. But if we are using backlogs, using stories, if we're doing sprints, and at the end of the sprint we have nothing to show, we have nothing that could potentially hit the market. When I say potentially hit the market, I always say that this first uh, few user stories should be a proof of concept, should be something that only works on a test environment and, and couldn't be shown out of a business. Okay, that's right. And then the next few user stories, you should have a crappy product like, a, like a, 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 a miserable product, like a product you will be ashamed of. But you know what? The founders of LinkedIn, they said, if you are not ashamed of the first version of your product, you waited too long. <laughs> You've waited too long, and the market keeps moving, and you are waiting to have like the perfect product. So first of all, you have a proof of concept. Second, you have a shameful, miserable, shitty product. And then you have a poor product. And then you have a mediocre product. And at some given moment, Nah, you have a product, and that's great. Because if someone put a gun on my head at the, medium, at, at, the, at the half of the project, I could put something online, like a product or a mediocre product. If you want, I can go live now. And if you reach that state, you are never concerned with estimates anymore, because there's always a product. And there's always something we could do. Are we on time? We deliver on time? What, what do you mean on time? We have this. Do you want to ship it or not? Now it's your question. Do you want to ship this or not? No, I want the Ferrari. We're past that mentality in many of the companies I'm coaching. And then you will have like mediocre product, product, nice product, amazing product, awesome product. Hmm? Spoiler alert, we never ship the awesome product. <laughs> we never get there. <laughs> but it would be nice once in every while that we can ship an awesome product. We make it awesome over time. We launch a product, a product and then we iterate and we iterate and we iterate. You know, I remember the times where, uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember when the company started getting websites. You think that everyone had a website <laughs> uh, like, like, like 100 years ago, people have websites? No. <laughs> I remember the time where companies started getting websites. And those were very waterfallish products. Uh, project, sorry. You asked a company outside to design a website and then, we'll de and then you will say, okay, they will, you know, uh, develop the website, put it online, and then that's done. You know, the website is online, you don't have to touch it anymore because that's our website. Nowadays, websites are dynamic. People interact with them, they give you information, they give you functionalities, like the website of a bank right now is the bank. So you have a web team that is continuous over time. So it doesn't make any sense to have a delivery date for the website. There's always something going on on the website. So what we're doing with tribes and safe trains and supercells and whatever you call them is to stabilize teams and say, now you live here. Now this product will go on forever. And now you iterate and you iterate and you iterate. And then suddenly launch date or launch time or, or delivering on time makes little sense because you are always delivering things. Anyway, that was my first metaphor and then we have the problem of adapting to customer feedback, okay? So I've already told you about these companies where the product owner has a backlog of 1,000 functionalities and they want them all. I'm going to tell you about another problem I've had. I don't know if anyone in the room have had this problem before, let's see. So my problem is, let's say, this is a metaphor, let's say we have someone that is working with packets in a, in a warehouse and this person has a problem. Now there's a computer in the warehouse and they want me to enter the barcode of the packet in the computer, but I'm holding the packet, I have no hands. So I have to like, like you know, try to read the barcode and many packets are falling to the floor and they're breaking. And that's a problem and we want to fix that. 
and then we tell our manager. And then our manager, when he knows that we are having such problems and that nobody cares, he's like super angry, saying, look in which, con in which conditions my people need to work. And they start making noise, and he talks to the CEO of the company. And the CEO of the company, <laughs> He's like, I have so many things on my mind. I want to go play golf <laughs> with the stakeholders. I want to smoke my Cuban cigars. <laughs> and now these guys are telling me something about the warehouse and the packets and the barcodes. And I don't have any idea of what's happening, but I want to keep everyone happy. So what I would do is I will talk to the CIO of the company. And then the CIO of the company is like, great. So now I was like super concerned with my cloud project. I was moving the whole infrastructure to the cloud. And now this guy from the warehouse, from logistics, says that he has some kind of problems with packets and boxes and whatever. I don't have time for this. So he delivers the problem to our project manager. And the project manager is like, oh, great. Now that I had finished all my gun charts and all my capacity management and everything is perfect, now suddenly I have to squeeze another project into the year. I don't have time. I don't have resources. I don't have the capacity. You know what? I'm going to ask a vendor for it. I'm going to outsource this problem, okay? So now a salesperson from the vendor, a salesperson from the outsourcing company comes to talk about this project with the company. And he's the only one that is happy in this drawing. <laughs> This is the only person that is happy in this whole ecosystem because he gets to sell something, yay, money. <laughs> and, and he says, uh, so the project manager says, do you have like packet tracking, barcode reading, scanning technology? And he says, yeah, whatever, sure. Thing. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and then he signs the contract and he delivers to the, um, outsourcing company product owner and the outsourcing company product owner is like what's this I don't understand it uh, <laughs> what have you sell okay I don't know I would talk to with my team and then he delivers it to the team um, basically the teams have no one else to deliver this problem to so so basically they get it on their pants now it's their problem so they are like you know dudes you have to deliver something for you know, barcode reading, scanning, packets, tracking, whatever. And they say, okay. And they, they design a gun. A gun that you can beep, use to read the barcodes. And we delivered that to the packet guy. And he's like, you're kidding, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have hands! <laughs> God forbid, God forbid that at any given moment, please don't let this happen in your companies, God forbids that at any given moment, these guys here get to talk to this guy here. No way, because then bad things happen. This guy could get crazy with power and start asking for features or something. Do not talk to the customer, talk to me. I want to take control of things. And that's the reason that most of the developers in agile companies think, still think that the customer is a, is a mythological being. It's like Santa Claus. It's something that the project manager has invented in order to get some budget. But I've been here for 40 years. I've never seen a customer. <laughs> they do not exist. They are like elves <laughs> and goblins. I don't know. <laughs> and then some people in agility still believe that, and I'm going to throw a big one. Um, some people still believe that agility is about doing, uh, it's about doing twice the crap, twice as fast. <laughs> Um, and I'm sorry, this is going to be recorded and this is going to be online, but I also have to defend my own positions. Uh, Jeff Sutherland, creator of Scrum, published a book that is called Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. I'm sorry, I don't agree that that's the whole point of Scrum. Uh, probably that's the way of selling a lot of books, I don't know. But I don't think that the whole thing that we're talking about is about doing twice the work in half the time. In fact, I don't think it's about doing more work. I think it's about getting twice the results with the same amount of effort. That would be great. 
that let's talk about results and not about work. Let's talk about customer experience and not about time. We are still working about work and time. We are talking in those terms which are very project oriented and productivity and, and factory and all that. Um, and I think that's not the whole thing. So again, adapting to understanding the customer, delivering something, see if it works or not, and then getting some feedback and iterating the project. If you are still working on an ecosystem where the product owner, as I had today, is the person that translates business requirements to technical specifications. I'm sorry, you still have a long way to go. Product owner is not that. Product owner is a person that, for me, it solves four problems. The problem of understanding, the problem of prioritization, the problem of information, and the problem of validation. The problem of understanding is not about writing user stories, it's about making sure that they understand the problem of the person that is handling boxes and have to put that barcode into the system. I don't have to write user stories or write requirements, maybe I have to bring the person, let them talk to him. That's what I do as a product owner, because I need you to understand, not to have a requirement or a specification. Jeff Patton is probably the most knowledgeable person on this in the planet, and he says, people come to me all the time, and he says, Jeff, we need better user stories. Jeff, we need better documents. And he says, no, we need better conversations. Conversations are the great agile tool. And I will talk about that more, a little bit more in a minute. Anyway, ooh, long way to go still. Third part of being agile, or being an agile company, having uh, amazing teams, okay? So I've been talking for more than half an hour now, let's do a small exercise. Can you all please stand up, all, everyone, can you please, if at any, okay? Everyone stand up, okay? Now everyone sit down. <laughs> According to my experience, once you have stand up once, the second time is way easier. <laughs> so now, I want you to think if you've ever been part of an awesome, incredible team. And if you've been part of an awesome team, pay respect to them, stand up now. Wow. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> this is way more than I usually get in conferences. Usually I get stand up, I keep standing. Usually I get like 30% of the audience or 40% of the audience, so congratulations. Give yourself a big applause. That's awesome. Great way. So now I want you to keep standing up, keep standing up, if you think that this team that you were part of was twice as better, twice as better, and you can give better whatever the meaning you want, if it was twice as better as any other team you've met in your life, keep standing up. If not, sit down. So some people sit down and say, okay, it was an awesome team, but it was not twice as better as every other team I've met. Maybe they were not that awesome. <laughs> now the percentage seems closer to what I expect. Now keep standing up if you think that being part of, those of the team was three times better than any other team that you have been part of. If not, sit down. <laughs> so let's keep playing. Four times better. <laughs> Five times better. <laughs> Even look, there's some people that say, no, I, I've been part of a team that was five times better. Whatever that means, than any other team I've ever met. Ten times better. A hundred times better. Give a, give a, a huge round of applause to these brave guys. Now you can sit down. So we are looking at the potential of having teams that are a hundred times better than anything you've ever seen. The problem is, if you haven't seen that, you can't imagine. It's like I told you, it, if I tell you about penguins and you've never seen penguins, you will never, and, you, and I'm like, but I've seen them. You're like, no, but you know, penguins are nice in theory, but here in this company, it's not possible, which is what people tell me about agility. No, agility looks nice in the papers, but I'm like, you haven't seen it. If you've seen it, if you've experienced it, there's no turning back. Anyone that has been part of such a system never goes back. It's like, no, sorry, I can't go back to the old ways. I want to experience this over and over and over. And we could talk a lot about this, uh, these amazing teams, but I'm going to give you two, two quick examples of things that, that uh, will give me an idea 
Oh, I have a lot of... <laughs> I'll give you some ideas on what I'm talking about. For instance, um, I see amazing teams, and amazing teams, they don't need daily meetings anymore. Uh, I had an amazing team once in one of my customers, and they came to me and said, hey, Angel, we don't understand why should we do uh, daily meetings. And I, li I was like, I don't either. <laughs> why are you doing daily meetings? And they're like, oh, well, we are supposed to do daily meetings. Scrum says that. I was like, you know what? Daily meetings are a solution to three problems. In the same way that the product owner is a solution to four problems, the daily meeting is a solution to three problems. The problem of team synchronization, the problem of updating the information of the project, and the problem of asking for help and detecting impediments soon enough that we can do something. But you guys, you're sitting at the same table. You're talking to, you're talking to each other the whole day. You are working together the whole day in the same user stories. As, as soon as one user story is done or there's any change, you go and you update the board and you update Jira, and then any single time someone needs help, there's someone else that is helping that person. So why are you doing the daily meeting? They stood up and they are like, well, daily meeting, um, as you all know, because you were there, I'm working on that. And as you all know, because that was like five minutes ago, I asked you for help, and I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, I'm doing Scrum. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> So when you have an amazing team, they don't need the daily meeting anymore. On the other hand, I see those teams where you have the first person on the team saying, okay, so I'm working on the black project, and yesterday I did this, and today I did that, and uh, this is my product. And you look at the rest of the team, and the rest of the team is like <laughs> <laughs> And then the second person says, well, I'm working on the yellow project, and in the yellow project, yesterday I was doing this, and today I'm doing that, and the rest of the team is like <laughs> And then the third person comes and says, well, I'm working on the red project. And then you see two guys saying, why are we doing this? And they say, because now we're agile. And, you go, oh. <laughs> and you have six people, and they're working on six different projects. And you call that a team. Come on, you're kidding. It's again the same thing. I have my people, I call them a team, because I've read books where they say that having teams is awesome, that teams are the ultimate competitive advantage. So hey guys, now you're a team. It's the same thing with leaders. Haven't you noticed that we don't have bosses anymore? Now you have leaders. That's awesome. <laughs> hey Joe, what? You're not the warehouse manager anymore. Now you're the warehouse leader. <laughs> What's a warehouse leader? I don't know. It's like a manager but with asteroids or something. I don't know. <laughs> if you call people leaders now, they're suddenly they're like better. I don't know. So there's like a huge corporate macro where they're changing manager for leader and now we are agile. <laughs> No, so again, the, the, the daily meeting problem is that we still don't get the mindset. We are doing the tools, we are doing the practices, but we don't get the mindset. For instance, um, there's... Uh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you can take longer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I won't make it very long. Anyway, um, there's this Argentinian guy that uh, was... Uh, he studied at Harvard, and he was a professor of accountancy or contability, I don't know, in MIT, and then he was fed of it, and then he started talking about organizations and people, and he wrote a book that is called Conscious Business Coaching. His name is Fred Kaufman, and I do recommend that you search for his talks online. He's amazing, he's very bright. And he has a metaphor that I like very much. He says, if you ask people what's your work, what's your job, people usually will say, well, I, I, I'm a tester, I test. Or I'm a developer, I develop. And you're like, no shit. <laughs> but that's not your work. Your work is not your work. If you ask a taxi driver what's your work, what's your job, he will say, uh, drive a taxi. But if you say, okay, what's the problem you're solving? Uh, he will say, okay, I'm solving the problem of people to get to their destiny uh, on time. <coughs> And if you had that in your mind, then sometimes you should say to your customer, I'm glad to take you, but there's a huge traffic jam, there's a gridlock. You'd be better said if you take the subway. No taxi driver is going to make that anyway, because you know, they, they think that their job is to drive a taxi and charge customers. And that's the problem in our companies. Everyone thinks that their job is their job. Um, and that happens with human resources and with audit and with legal. And the problem, and I'm going to that in a minute, is that these people think that they are doing their job, but they are putting sticks in our wheels in our delivery of value. And that's the problem in order to have an agile organization. That's one of the problems. So anyway, if you have a football team, and you take 
you talk to the guy that, uh, that is, uh, I, I know nothing about football, but you have a guy in the front and he's in charge of, you know, scoring. And you say, for each goal you score, I will pay you another million dollars. And he says, oh, cool. And then you have the goalkeeper. And you tell the goalkeeper, this is what you get at the end of the season, but for every goal you take, I will subtract one million dollars. And then suddenly you have a team that is never going to win any matches. Because you have a, uh, uh, the guy in the front, I don't know his name, he's in, he's in Spanish, he's a little, I'm sorry? Forward. The forward, whatever. Uh, thank you. <laughs> There's five minutes to end the game and we are winning 1-0 and we ask that guy to come back and defend and he says, no, sorry, I'm not doing that. I will stay here because I still have a chance to score one goal and make another million. So he's not defending because that's not his job. And then you have a goalkeeper that prefers that we lose the match 0-1 than to win the match 7-6. Because in 7-6, I took six goals. In 0-1, I only took one. So he prefers that we lose. So that team is never going to work because they don't, see the they don't see the game and the match as something that they are all doing together. They all see their individual parts. And when I see a Kanban board and I see names on the tasks, I, I am like, I, they still don't get it. It's, that's my user story, I will do it. That's my coding, that's my testing. I don't like that. I like teams where they get one user story and they go together the whole field until the end as a team, scrum, rugby. It was all about that, about functioning as a unit. And we still have scrum teams where you have goalkeepers and, and forwards and whatever. So yeah, awesome teams. In order to have awesome teams, you have to make them see the big picture. What are we trying to solve here? And then we have the problem of continuous improvement. Um, I'm not going to spend time here because I want to talk about how we move that to the rest of the organization. But I usually say that agility over time is not like the usual product. We are not agile, we are not agile, we are not agile, we are not agile. Then January the 1st, we roll out the new agile organization. Pfft, now we are agile. <laughs> Now it's not like that, it's more like continuous improvement and that's the problem. The problem here is that some people are already here and are saying, oh you don't need Scrum anymore, you don't need to do daily meetings anymore, you don't need product owners anymore. In fact, if you're doing all those things, you're a loser. And we have a lot of that in the Agile community. Our favorite sport is looking at things and saying, that's not Agile. <laughs> we love that. Because it's like, I'm better than that. You know what's the definition of an alcoholic? An alcoholic is anyone that drinks more than me. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> He's an alcoholic. <laughs> so in Agile, we have something very similar. Anyone that is not as Agile as me, he's not Agile. No, no I mean, it's not Agile or not Agile. It's not binary. I see people coming to these conferences and saying, we have one release every six months. And, and people laugh at them. One release every six months. Oh, you're not Agile. And then these people say, like, oh, crap. I'm never going to an Agile conference anymore. <laughs> Instead of that, we should be asking, how many releases were you doing three years ago? And maybe they say once every two years, and you're like, congratulations, you are four times more agile than you were two years ago. Right now, the only thing I ask is don't stop there. Now try to release every three months, and then every month, and then every two weeks, I don't know. Don't stop there, but congratulations. We have to also congratulate ourselves in the long way that we've already gone. So yes, again, um, more on the Pokeball in a minute. <laughs> four things. Early and continuous delivery of value, um, <clears throat> adapting to feedback, and adapting to reviews, and trying to you know, work with our customers in solving their problems, having awesome teams, and having continuous improvement. Not stopping, always asking what's the next thing we can do in order to become more agile, to deliver more value, more frequently, adapting more, having more awesome teams. But then when we started working with the bank, um, some people said, uh, you know, this is nice for teams that have to develop a product, so they have like user stories and backlogs, but we are a process team. We are giving credit, like leasing. We had a team that was doing leasing, and there was another team that was maintaining the ATM network. They are like, you know, we all day what we do is replenishing the net, the ATMs, and putting money in the ATMs, the teller machines, and fixing the ones that are broken, and cleaning the, the ATMs, and that's it. Over and over and over. There's no product, there's no backlog, there's no like delivery date. So it makes little sense to us, and we realized that the Agile vocabulary was not engaging with these people. 
We used the, the shield with these this four things of agility for two years, and we uh, launched 200 agile teams with that concept. But when we started moving the concept out of software and we started talking to the people at leasing, audit, human resources, we need a new metaphor. We needed a new metaphor. And the metaphor was the Pokeball, <laughs> the Pokemon ball. And that's what I used to explain Lean, the principles of Lean. And I say, you know, in Lean, my vision, sorry, it's a, it's a very condensed vision, but in the center of all, you have value again. And value is what the customer values. And customer is someone that is not in the payroll of the company. The customer is not the vice president of marketing. The customer is not the warehouse leader or the warehouse manager or however you want to call that person. He is not the customer. The customer is someone outside the company. And we have to figure out what's the one thing we do better than anyone in order to solve this person's problem. Because the day we lose that track, the company is doomed. I really believe that. And you will be amazed on how many companies I gather together and I say, what's the value we provide? And they say, oh, things like, oh, we provide value to our stakeholders uh, through sustained growth or some kind of other bullshit bingo, I don't know. Um, and, and then I say, no, 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 what's the value? Oh, our value is to be the number one or the biggest. And you're like, no, that's a strategy. And, and even it's a bad strategy, maybe, I don't know. What's the problem we solve? And many people can't figure out for their lives. They don't know what's value, they don't know who's the customer, they don't know how we're doing that better than any other people, or how that aligns with the strategy of the company and the vision. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Then there's a foundation, and the foundation in Lean is, uh, again, continuous improvement, but it's Hansei and Kaizen. These are two Japanese words. Hansei means reflection. You need space to continuously reflect. And then Kaizen is continuous improvement, small improvement over time. So we need to stop, reflect, and then do something. Many teams, they are doing retrospectives, Hansei, but they are not doing any improvements, Kaizen. And the problem is that we keep talking about the same problems over and over and over and over. That's what I call, let's see how you translate this, guys. <laughs> The Groundhog Day retrospective. Do you remember Groundhog Day did this movie with Bill Murray where he was trapped in the same day over and over and over? That's the Groundhog Day retrospective. How many of you have been there? Like the same retrospective week after week after week. And then one day someone says, let's stop doing retrospective. I'm like, good idea. That will fix the problem. <laughs> So Hansei and Kaizen, and on top of that, we have three, for me, the three key points of, of Lean are a systemic vision, uh, its flow, and its pull. These are three concepts that allowed us to talk to people in process teams like, like uh, human resources. We don't call it that, we call it uh, human talent because resources, come on. 21st century, but, but we call it human talent and then we arrive at human talent and say, hey, let's try to figure out what's the value that human talent is bringing to our organization and to our clients. And let's figure out how to flow and how to pull and how to have a systemic vision and how to continuously improve that value proposition. And it worked like charm and we did the same with leasing and ATMs. For instance, in the first month of applying these ideas to uh, the ATM team in this company, we improved the availability of the ATM network in 60%, and we still maintain that, one month. And you're like, wow, that's amazing, what did you use? Oh, we use a magical trick. We use an alien technology that we agilists have uncovered, that's called talking to each other. <laughs> Because the problem here was that we had some guy with, you know, the, 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 the shielded wagons with the money that was putting money into the ATMs, and he was arriving at the ATM, and the ATM was closed because someone was cleaning it. Oh, crap. So he went and keep on with his round because he had to make some times. But then that ATM was clean, but was empty, and then it was not available. And that was happening over and over and over, with the people fixing the hardware, with the people updating the software, with the people replenishing the money. And the answer I got when I said, hey, let's these people work cross-functionally and talk to each other, was like, oh, but they are from different suppliers. And I'm like, oh, but I don't give a shit. <laughs> Not my freaking problem. <laughs> I don't care. What's the impediment here? And sometimes these are preconceived ideas of you have to keep you know, suppliers separated and you have to talk to them. I'm the manager. I have to talk to each other. No, teams. Again, 
So when we form a team of people that were working in different suppliers, everything, you know, become evident how to fix the problem. You know? So with these ideas, um, for instance, we have several teams, like for instance in human resources, human talent, that they measure their performance and the value they were uh, delivering by how much work they were doing. Oh, we've done 1,008 interviews this month. Wow, amazing, that's like 35% more than last month, fantastic. How many people have we hired? How many problems have we solved? Oh, none, uh, but, but we're doing a lot of interviews. And you're like, yeah, we should review the process. We should look at who's the client, who's the person that we are solving a problem for, and then say, how do we measure the results? And then we, go, we went and used this alien technology and we talked to the clients, we talked to the people inside the company and said, what's the reason we have a human resource department? What problem should they be solving? And everyone was like, I'm glad you make me that question. Because sometimes I feel that I work for the human resource department. You know, I'm trying to you know, give credit to our customers because see, that's what we do at a bank. But then I can't because the human resource department is calling saying, hey, you haven't sent me the holiday plan and then they say, hey, you haven't done the performance reviews. And they say, hey, you haven't set the goals for the next uh, quarter. And then they say, hey, you have to send me the salaries uh, and the raises for the next year. And they say, hey, you have to send me the training plan. And you're like, crap, now I work for human resources. I cannot give credit because I'm all the day delivering things to the human resource department. You ask that person for a net promoter score. He's going to say, do not talk to these guys. They are problems. They are an impediment, and if you are part of an organization and the rest of the organization sees you as an impediment, think about it. If they had the chance to do it on their own or maybe hire someone outside, would they hire you? If the answer is no, you're not solving the problem better than anyone else. You are just, they are just stuck with you. And for me, that's a very low level of agility. So that's the reason many people are ditching KPIs like how much we are doing for OKRs, key results. What's the result of our efforts? So instead of telling me that the bus is going very fast and is consuming very, very little diesel, tell me how far are we from our destiny? And you say, ah, oh, I don't know, I don't know where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about the performance of the bus if we are not getting closer to our target, closer to our destiny. And then another problem we had, and this is, this is something we experience in, in software teams, but then we, go, we were able to see the same over and over and over when we went to leasing and marketing and audit and purchasing departments and human resources. The problem was that people were coming and saying, hey, I asked for 100 people that I need in my part of organization, 100 profiles, uh, why, do I have, uh, why are not they here? Uh, you're not hiring anyone. And then they went to the hiring people. And they say, oh yeah, uh, the problem is that we cannot hire them because we don't have the, the authorization from the people in salaries or whatever, the people that was doing uh, compensation. And then, okay, then I went to compensation and I say, hey, why don't you have a compensation proposal so the hiring people can hire the people that I need? And they say, no, we have some ideas, but the problem is that we haven't accounted for the training plan and the training budget. Because the people in training, they haven't given us the, the training budget for these new people that you're hiring, these scrum masters. We don't know how much should we spend in the budget. Okay, so I go talk to the training people and say, hey, why don't you have the training plan from the scrum masters that I need in order to have a compensation plan that I need in order to hire them? And they say, oh, it's the problem is that we don't have a career plan. You, have to, you should talk to growth people, to career plan. So I go to career people and I ask them and they say, hey, yeah, the problem is that it's not clear in our culture how these people will fit. So I go talk to the culture people. You see, have you ever been there? Just raise your hand, share your, yes, brother. <laughs> share your pain. And then you are, you know, running around the whole company trying to figure out where your people at. But the problem is that you are not the only one. You are someone from, I don't know, uh, people banking, but you have people from business banking, government banking, and you have people from marketing, and, from and everyone is asking for the same questions. So you have many people coming to, from everywhere, asking questions everywhere, trying to figure out what, how things are working. It's the same thing that happened when we had architects, analysts, developers, testers, infrastructure guys, and you couldn't figure out for, the, for your life what was happening with your project. And then, and this is a, a statement by Jürgen de Smet, which is a, a good friend and also I want to give proper credit. He says, when companies have a problem and they have money, 
what they do is they create a role. And they say, we have a mess here. We are going to create a role. And this role, usually in our technical organization, was called project manager. Hmm? Your goal is to make some sense on whatever is happening here. And he says, I have a better idea. And you say, which, which, which is what? And you say, how about I shoot myself? <laughs> You know, in human resources, they have something that they call the human resource partner. And this was a person you talk in order to be an interface with the organization. Sorry, an interface is not the solution for this problem. It's like when, we have, when you have five architects for 500 developers, and they are overwhelmed. They are a bottleneck. And then they put a product owner for the architects, and problem solved. And you're like, no, you haven't solved the problem. There's a bottleneck. And if you want to solve bottlenecks, which has something to do with the concept of flow, if you have a bottleneck in your organization, the problem is that value is not flowing because everyone is waiting for the bottleneck. Here is where I apply, and I'm going to close in the next five minutes. Here's where I apply the Starbucks principle. I read once that in Starbucks, somebody said, you know, everything in this company exists in order to support the barista, the coffee maker, the person that is serving the coffee, because that's the touch point of our client. That's the delivery of the Starbucks experience. And anything that goes in the way of the barista is going to be eliminated, or is going to be seriously a problem for this company. Okay? Now imagine, for a minute, that the purchasing department in Starbucks worked as your purchasing department. <laughs> Well, not yours, because you are very agile companies, but outside of this building, you know how purchasing departments work? I tried to figure that out, and I imagine the barista trying to get some coffee, and they are out of coffee, and they say, we have to buy some coffee. And they say, whoa, 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 what do you mean, buy some coffee? First, I need a list of 10 pre-approved vendors. <laughs> pre-approved vendors, what's that? No, I need a list, you know, I need their financial statements, and I need the, the, the description of their uh, board, and I have to see that they are not related to our board, because that could be a conflict of interest. And then I also need a, a declaration. You know, uh, I work a lot in Latin America, and something that I have to sign, it's a paper saying that I'm not financing activity, I'm not financing activities that are tied to drug traffic or, uh, or money laundering. And I sign that paper and I say, okay, here you have the paper. Now I have a question. <laughs> Do you think that somebody that is financing drug trafficking and money laundering will have any problem signing this? <laughs> like, here you are, drug traffickers. Here you are, money laundering. Sign this paper. No, sorry, that's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so you make all the paperwork, but you're not done. You still need a forecast on how much coffee are you going to need in the next five years in increments of 15 minutes. And you're like, you're kidding me, right? And in the meantime, the queue of people waiting for coffee is going around and around the block. You cannot work like that if you're Starbucks. In Starbucks, I don't know, but I figure out that the purchasing department in Starbucks works in a way that the barista thinks that the coffee jar is magical. It never gets out of coffee. I'm just getting coffee, getting coffee, getting coffee. It never gets empty because there's somebody that is constantly replenishing the coffee and making sure you will always have coffee. You know how you, make, how you get a laptop if you are working at Facebook? If you're working at Facebook and you need a laptop, you stand up, you go to a, a wardrobe or whatever, to a, or, a, or a shelf, and you get a laptop, and you go to your place, and now you have a laptop. That's two minutes of your time. Amazing. Now, how, how it is getting a laptop on traditional companies? <laughs> You're a, consultancy le you're a consultant level three, yeah. No, you cannot get a laptop. You need to be consultant level four. <laughs> What's a consultant level four? You don't have a budget. <laughs> you didn't ask for the laptop six months ago. That's the time we need in order to provide a laptop. <laughs> you have to write me a ticket. <laughs> That's a good one. Hey, my computer is not working. Don't talk to me. <laughs> write a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> that human resources, Audi, legal, all these support areas of the company, they should be supporting the baristas. And if you're in a company where the software teams are the baristas and they are developing the experience, we should have systemic teams uh, that are caring for the whole problem since the customer has a problem until we are able to solve that problem perfectly. And we should make sure that that happens
better and better and better over time. And I don't care if you say it's the law, it's the process. Um, I used to say that once I was in Israel, in a company, <laughs> and some of you remember that, and I was like, don't tell me more about process. Who gave you the process? Moses in the top of the Mount Sinai, and I was like, fuck, I'm in Israel. <laughs> they were very forgiving. <laughs> I was like, sorry. That's something we say a lot, a lot in Spain. Oh, it's like, it's written in stone or something. And then I realized there might be some cultural problem there. <laughs> they were very forgiving. <laughs> anyway, process, process. Who made the process? Can the person that made the process come here so we can discuss with him? And then nobody knew who the, problem, the process person was. That's, oh, that happens all the time. I asked for the process person, come here, let's discuss. There's no process person. There's just the process. <laughs> it emerged. <laughs> okay. So, close. Um, there were a couple of other things I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about, briefly, uh, moving from a push organization to a pull organization. Push organization is the organization where, you, where they say, we need these 1,000 features. Or there's a project portfolio of 75 projects and they have to be done this year, that's push. Here you have 75 projects, they are all important, do them all. In a pool organization, we will say, there's a million projects we could be doing right now. Which is the one project that we can do in the next three months that delivers the most value and it's most aligned with our objectives and key results, our, stra our strategy. In a pool organization, most of the conversations in the, in the hallways would be about the customer and about success and about results and about satisfaction and about quality instead of the kind of conversations I constantly hear in the hallways, which are conversations about budget and deadlines and capacity and allocations and, and I have money, why are not, you not making my project? What do you mean? My money means nothing or what? That's not a pool organization, okay? So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Anyway, the whole model comes to this smiling face, okay? And this smiling face basically says, if we can make the company see that agility is about four things, the delivery of value, the adaptation to customers and the collaboration with customers and feedback, having awesome teams, systemic teams, solving, problem-solving teams, problem-solving teams, stop talking about performance and throughput and capacity and delivery. We want to increase the delivery. We want to increase the throughput. You're going to have twice the crap, twice as fast. Instead of that, we want to solve twice as many problems, twice as better. That's the poor organization. If we talk about improvement, and then if we also have this idea of having constant reflection, having space for everyone so, to reflect on what can we do better, to improve, and to improve in the sense of delivering more value to our customers, to having a systemic view, instead of having the goalkeeper, the defense, the attack, seeing the whole match, seeing the whole game. If we make our companies flow, if we look at work, and we try to figure out every single time something stops and we are waiting for something to be taken care of, that should be a major alarm in a modern company. Because in modern days, it's not the big fish that eats the small fish, it's the fast fish that eats the slow fish. You know how many people work in WhatsApp? 55 guys, 55 freaking guys, and they were able to destroy every other messaging application in the market. They were even able to destroy all the text message strategies of the big operators, like nobody thinks that they are going to make money selling text messages anymore because we have WhatsApp. And those are for 55 guys. And then they sold the company to Facebook and the valuation was something like $19 billion. 55 guys. It's not more about the big fish eating the small fish. It's about the fast fish, the adaptive, agile fish eating the slow, waterfallish, sluggish fish. So we have to flow. Everything that stops and nobody's taking care of that. I don't care process, I don't care structure, I don't care tools, we have to fix that. And then we have to move to a pool organization. And the last part of the model, the smile, and this is by my dear friend uh, Stasha, which you can find at Agile Evolution on Twitter. Hello Stasha. Um, she made a very clever diagram. She said, you know what? Our goal is from the moment we have an idea, and here you can see how old I am that I still, pick, uh, I still draw 
uh, light bulbs that have a resistance inside. <laughs> you can see my age here. <laughs> From the moment we have an idea, we figure out how to fix a problem of our customer, our client, that person that lives outside of the company and it's king. And we figure out a way of making his life a little bit better. And with any luck, get some money in the process which will make us sustainable and that would be great because we can fix more problems for our customers and in the gathering of feedback on how did you like it what's your problem how can we make it better the whole thing that we are doing in an organization no matter how big it is no matter what's your market no matter what's your product we are just doing two things we are shortening the cycle and we are eliminating all the frictions in the delivery of value and in the gathering of feedback and i think that this is a perfect place to leave my talk up in here so thank you sweethearts now go walk the world